Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation on CD4 chimeric antigen receptors to redirect CD4 T cells to target HIV infection. I am Lisa Berkby from Nexalum Bioscience, where we have a team of experts in the science of cell counting and cell-based assays, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I am excited to present our first speaker, Dr. James Riley, who is a professor of microbiology at the University of Pennsylvania. For a complete biography on Dr. Riley, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Riley, you may now begin your presentation. Somehow Andrea's slides are appearing in front of me. Can you get it from my slides up here? Hello? Uh-oh. Can anybody hear me? Dr. Riley, there's a tab at the top of your screen ah, for there. your presentation. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Um, uh, just want to, before I get into the talk, share uh, a disclosure um, in which some of the technology that I'll speak on today has been licensed to community. Uh, so, um, you know, back in the 90s, uh, we developed a series of antiviral drugs, and the hope would be is that we'd be able to cure HIV at that point once we were able to uh, stop all the uh, replication. Um, and there, this uh, chart here shows the, um, you know, the acute phase uh, and the loss of T cells. Um, and then what generally happens patients go on and then this leads to um, a loss of, of T cells over time. But the, the problem that happened was is um, there's a latent reservoir generated by HIV, and no matter how much art we give to people, it, it, this reservoir uh, continues, and it doesn't. You know, while it does have a slow half life, it nobody would ever be cured of, of HIV for light on this. And so the focus of the field is to how can we get rid of this latent reservoir? And one strategy that's been put forth is it's called a kick and kill strategy in which some agent that's called a latency reversal agent um, is, is given to a person. And what this um, agent does is that it uh, provides enough of a stimulus to the T cell or to the cell harboring the HIV to initiate a burst to transcription, uh, HIV transcription, and then that would then enable the immune system to recognize the cell and hopefully uh, remove it. And, and while this is an elegant idea, um, it, it's, it, it hasn't worked terribly well. Uh, one, the, the latency reversal agents are not universally effective, so they only target maybe a fraction of the cells that harbor HIV. And uh, at the time that these are administered, the HIV-specific immune system is in bad shape. Uh, antigen has been largely away, so the uh, memory response is greatly attenuated. And the cells that are remaining are exhausted, and they uh, recognize um, uh, escape mutants that really aren't present. So. Um, there, there's a need then to sort of rebuild the HIV specific immune response before we do these types of kick and kill uh, strategies. And so the argument I'd like to make is 
you know, instead of using the natural immune system, um, we're now at the point now where an engineered immune system would be perhaps more desirable. And the example I like to use is, is RoboCop. Uh, so RoboCop was a movie that um, in which uh, a, a very good cop uh, was uh, you know patrolling the streets of Detroit, and a bad gay came in and he got hurt really badly. But instead of just restoring Alex Murphy back to where he was, uh, the, the city and the company decided, let's make him uh, so that the next time he sees his gang, he'll be able then to, to defeat it. And so they gave him some armor, um, as well as a, a, a very uh, potent weapon by which he could then control this gang. And I, and I think the HIV uh, immune response is very, um, could be very similar to this. Uh, initially, uh, the HIV immune response is like Alice Murphy, where it really gets decimated by HIV. And so what we propose then is, can we make, make a RoboCop version of the HIV immune response, which will hopefully be able to work much better than it did the first time. And so one of the initial efforts in this uh, was a study uh, that our center conducted looking at the ability of zinc finger nucleases to make uh, CD4 cells HIV resistant. Um, and for the sake of time, I'll go through this very quickly, but you know, this isn't like uh, what some of you may have heard, you know, uh, where people receive a, a bone marrow transplant containing CCR5 deficient bone marrow, and that results in a cure. There, every cell in the person, at least every immune cell, is CCR5 negative. In this particular case, we're only putting a fraction of the cells back in. And so we're not really limiting the spread of the virus, but what we're hopefully doing is uh, arming at least a part of the immune system so that it'd be HIV resistant. And the, the results of this trial were really quite interesting. Um, so the people received the cells and then um, were uh, participating in what's called an antiviral treatment eruption, in which they stopped taking their medicine. And then we observed the, you know, how quickly the virus rebounded. And, and in general, the virus rebounded pretty typically to what you see. There might be a slight delay. But in most of the patients, you can see once they reached this peak, there was a subsequent drop uh, in the viral load. And, you know, and then continue down. Now, one patient here actually went and then kind of went all the way down before we had to start therapy again. And so this gave us a sense that maybe there is some dominant immune response going on. So we followed this up with a, with a sort of a separate clinical trial um, in which we um, you know, did a few additional things that I can't go into, but we tried to increase the graphene by uh, some cytoxan. Um, and we also enrolled a number of Delta 32 uh, individuals. These are people that already have one mutant allele of CCR5 because that would enhance then the number of cells that were actually doubly deficient. Um, and as, again, what I showed you before, if we just look to the time when the virus rebounds um, compared to a, a very similar cohort, we see a slight delay, but it's, you know, maybe a couple weeks. So it's nothing to really write home about. But what got us interested in this study, more interested, I should say, there are a number of patients that are highlighted in this red here that were able to sustain a very long um, ATI. So the, the criteria that we had is that you had to have a viral load over 100,000 for three consecutive time. None of these patients you know, got there in 16 weeks. Uh, and the way we wrote the protocol is that they had the option to continue their ATI as long as they kept their viral load under 1,000. Um, and you can see three of these people, you know, with this individual right here almost kept it out a, a whole year. Um, and so we were interested in studying these patients to really try to understand how were they able to maintain this low viral load. And we looked at the HIV-specific immune responses. Um, now, only in these three patients did we see sort of a restoration of the HIV-specific immune response. You can see that in this particular case here, there's quite a profound expansion of this response considering we're you know assaying the entire cda repertoire here um so you know 
1.4% of the entire repertoire is able to see this particular pool. Um, and then to lesser extents, we saw a restoration of other responses of these things. Whereas in the other patients, there's a few here or there, but nothing really dramatic as we saw in these three patients that were able to maintain control. Um, and then in one of the patients, we were able then to really map the exact epitope that was expanded uh, here um, and then sequence the patient virus before the therapy and after the therapy. And what you can see is that at least one of these individuals, a full escape mutant was uh, emerged that you know, converted this into a, a non-recognizable epitope. So it suggests that the immunological pressure that was put was strong enough that HIV actually had to mutate in order to start replicating again. And so, you know, what this gave us hope is, is that yes, the immune system can be trained to uh, control HIV, uh, but this particular trial was, you know, only really uh, at the very beginning, where only a, a small fraction of CD4 cells were HIV resistant, and it's unclear how many of those CD4 cells were actually HIV specific. So the hypothesis that carried us to the next study is, well, what if we use chimeric antigen uh, receptor therapy and made all the, all the CD4 cells now HIV uh, specific? Um, and so I'll show you next the preclinical studies that have now led to us testing this in the clinic. And so uh, as a brief introduction, a chimeric antigen receptor uh, is a different way to direct T cells towards the target. Um, so in this particular case, and it gets a little confusing, so I'll walk you through it, um, where you are putting the CD4 molecule as the um, sort of the bait for HIV because CD4 is the natural receptor uh, for HIV envelope. And the, the reason we do that is because um, it makes it hard for HIV to escape because if HIV can't find a CD4, then it's gonna be hard for it to get around that. Um, but we're putting these CD4 cars into CD4 T cells. So work with me as I, as I try to explain that. Um, and then uh, after the CD4 targeting moiety, there we have a 41B or number of a costimulatory molecule and then coupled to the signal one to CD3 uh, chain. Um, and the, a, a study that we did um, you know, prior to this using CD8 T cells, we were able to show in this humanized mouse model that we were able to you know, significantly reduce the amount of virus that emerged after an analytical uh, treatment interruption compared to control cells. So we wanted to see, could um, the same activity exist in CD4 T cells? And so um, a graduate student, Kobe Wadini, uh, took this and the first thing we did was we uh, hooked up um, a variety of different costimulatory molecules uh, so um, this is CD28, ICOS, OX4D, 41B, and CD27. Um, he linked all these to a GFP marker so you could see both the CAR and the GFP uh, expression levels. Um, and then we, he did a, um, a mixing. So we took these cells and mixed them with a K562 cell that expressed HIV envelope and then tracked the ability of the T cells to make cytokines. And what you can see is that there is some heterogeneity uh, regarding how the costimulatory molecule affects T cell function. Uh, for example, this 41B molecule uh, makes much less cytokines uh, relative to uh, CD28 uh, molecule that makes many more cytokines. And this is consistent to what we saw with CD8 T cells. Um, the, the question we had is, well, can CD4 cells, can they actually control the replication of HIV? So here we took those cells I just described to you um, and we mixed them at these ratios with uh, infected CD4 T cells and asked, um, can they stop the spread of the infection? So if we mix in untransduced T cells, you can see, you know, this is a particular time point, day eight, we can see, you can see that there's quite a bit of HIV infection present. Um, with the CAR T cells, 
you can see at various rates, at, you know, 150, we see mostly control. But as we lower the factor to target ratio, um, we see some heterogeneity depending on the constimulatory molecule. You see here that the CD28 and the CD3 zeta control the HIV replication the best, whereas CD27, OX40 on down, actually uh, are worse than the CD3 zeta alone uh, signal. Um, we are interested in understanding the mechanism by which CD4 T cells could suppress HIV replication. So in this particular assay, Colby uh, super you know, got really infected uh, CD4 T cells, and he mixed them um, with the CAR T cells or unparent T cells uh, overnight, and looking to see could we clear this infection. So you can see with untransduced cells, we don't see any change. But at a four to one ratio uh, using uh, the CAR T cell, we see quite uh, significant removal of the cells. And then as we reduce the um, factor target ratio, we see less. Um, and then he was able to quantify this over a range showing that these uh, T cells are effective in um, removing the, the uh, HIV infected cells. Um, and then a similar assay, although a little uh, different, is here we measured the amount of cos phase three activity in the target cells. So we, we gated, uh, uh, you know, away from the cars and looked to see, are we seeing active killing in the target cell? And you can see, um, you know, there's not that much cos phase three activity in the absence of CAR T cells. But when we mix the CAR T cells at a high vector ratio, we see that a lot of them are actually inducing uh, CAS phase three. And again, here we're quantifying this, but I just wanted to point out that the CDA T cells with the 41B are roughly at the same range as the CD4 cells expressing the CD28 customatory deranged. Now, if we compare the fours fairly, the, the eights do work better than the fours. But with the optimal or at least a more effective cytokine, we get roughly the same level of killing. So this, this suggests that CD4 cells, in addition to their helper function, actually retain pretty good cytolytic facts, uh, ability that's roughly twofold less than uh, CD8 T cells. Um, and so, again, to sort of uh, further investigate this, we wanted to look at the ability of uh, CD4 cells to upregulate granzyme B as well as TNF. And again, this also occurs in a customatory uh, dependent manner, whereas the 41B signal or the 27 cellular, the uh, uh, TNF family members are less capable of upregulating this compared to the CD28 and the CD3 zeta alone. Um, and then further looking at this, look, we looked at the ability to upregulate CD107, which is a granulation that comes to the surface during the granulation, so it's a marker of uh, killing potential, uh, as well as the, the, uh, the uh, perforate, which actually puts the holes into the cells so that they get in. And again, CD4 cells were remarkably good at doing this. Again, not quite as effective as CD8 cells, but uh, Pretty, pretty effective at uh, eliciting all the aspects of the killing machinery. And then the, the, the last study uh, I'll go through uh, uh, was the Vivo study, where we, uh, in this particular study, we just used CD4 T cells expressing the CD4 car. Uh, very similar to the study we did with CD8 cells, where we, we got the cells infected, um, you know, these, because of proper host disease, these tend to be very short lived studies. So the you know the art was only present for four days uh, before we uh, put the CAR T cells in, and then asked uh, we basically looked at the ability of the CAR T cells to expand as well as the viral load. Um, and so we'll first look at the viral load. Uh, again, initially there's not that much viral load because the virus is still rebounding, but a week after that. We start seeing significant levels of viral load and some differences. Now, um, what was maybe somewhat perplexing to us is that the T cells that had the least functional capability actually uh, maintained the lowest viral load, 
whereas the cells with the highest killing uh, ability, the CD3 and the 28, the CD3 doing the worst, the 28 not doing as well as the 4B, and then eventually um, it kind of fell out of flavor as well. And so this paradox could be explained a little bit by just looking at the CAR T cell expansion um, in this model. So you can see that the 4B, we compare everything to the CD3 zeta, we see much more expansion of these T cells in vivo relative to the CD3 or the CD28. Um, and so what this tells us is that maybe the, it's better to have uh, more T cells with less uh, silo potential than it is to have less T cells that are really good killers. Um, and then the, the, the last, well, actually, one more slide for this. So we, you know, again, looked at this, uh, you know, just by flow, because we marked the cells, you can see uh, this is a point that's 12 days. You can see how many more CAR T cells are present with 4B relative to the other consumatory molecules. And again, this is quantified um, by this. Um, we did look at exhaustion markers. Um, again, the, the, the CARs with the CD28 family members express higher levels of these uh, exhaustion members than those with the 4B and OX40, um, suggesting that maybe these cells are able to maintain the function longer than these cells in an in vivo setting. Uh, and then the last study we did is uh, a little bit complicated, but we wanted to ask, can the CD4 cells actually help the CD8 cells? And so in this experiment, we have a control cells here, but here we have the CD8 CAR T cells um, mixed with CD28. And again, uh, these cells didn't work all that well in vivo beforehand, but we, we put those in there. Now we put it, half as many of these cells uh, here, and then with the other half of the CAR T cells, we added in the CD4 41 B cells. So there's a total of 2.5 uh, million effectors, but this one has a mixture of CD4 to CD8, and this just has the CD8 cells. And, and what you can see is early, we don't see much differences, but uh, later in the infection, I think this is like five weeks, um, we, see, we do see some expansion of the CD8 T cells, but we see much more robust expansion when there's a mixture. And again, these cells were started out as half as much as these cells. So the overall expansion is even more present here. Um, and then we see a, you know, granted not a massive difference in the viral load, but we do see that the, the, the mice here had lower levels of viral load compared to these mice here, suggesting that in addition to their killing activity, the CD4 T cells are actually able to augment the activity of the CD8 T cells. And so on that, I'll, I'll stop. Um, you know, most of these studies, again, were driven by a uh, phenomenal grad student, Kobe Badini, with help from Rachel Lehman did the thing, uh, Kevin Gaya, who was a, a tech in the lab that helped Kobe quite a bit. Um, we got great support from our animal facility core, uh, as well as the human immunology core. And the clinical trial I told you about was uh, the PI with Pablo Tadas, with the uh, help from actually the entire Center for Cellular Immunotherapy, but in particular, Julie Delosky and Pam Shaw. Um, and Sangamo, again, provided the zinc figure nucleases to us. And on that, I will stop. Thank you, Dr. Riley, for a great presentation. I would now like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Andrea Love. She is a Senior Business Development Manager here at Nexlum and one of our most requested speakers. For a complete biography on Dr. Love, please visit the bi biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Love, you may now begin your presentation. All right, thank you um, for the introduction, Lisa, and thank you so much, Jim, for that really excellent presentation. Um, I know I have lots of questions, um, but I'll I'll start off by giving my my little talk as well. So, um, you know, Jim gave a really great introduction for what I'm going to focus on, which is really addressing some of these in vitro analysis needs when you're dealing with cell therapy research and development. Um, and so I'm going to provide a, a brief overview 
overview of some of the challenges with immunotherapy. Um, and that's going to be the case for both um, viral based immunotherapy in the context of HIV, as Jim talked about, but also cancer immunotherapy and even some disease states such as autoimmunity. Um, talk a little bit about using image based platforms for cell based assays in that context, and then really dive into some data to really um, differentiate some of these assays that you can conduct. So immunotherapy is a very broad um, terminology for a diverse class of therapeutic modalities. Um, it refers to, of course, adoptive cell transfer-based therapies. So these would be categorized as cell therapies in the immunotherapy context. Those would be your CAR T-based therapies. And as Jim had described, um, you know, CARs can be CD4 T cells or CD8 T cells, um, have a variety of co-stimulatory molecules. We also have adoptive cell transfer for things like CAR NK cells. Um, as well as other sorts of cell therapy products like TCR-based T cells. Um, ultimately, these cells are going to be targeted against a particular antigen on a target cell of interest um, and ultimately directed to uh, illicit cell killing or uh, eradication of those target cells. Um, we have other non-cell immunotherapies, such as bispecific antibodies that serve as a bridge between a target cell and an immune cell. Um, we also have tumor-targeting monoclonal antibodies, and we also have other sorts of uh, generic or agnostic therapies, such as checkpoint inhibitors or um, cytokines or cytokine receptor inhibitors that uh, provide immunomodulatory impacts. Ultimately, the challenges for um, cell therapy efficacy, um, whether it's the case of uh, targeting or trafficking to a tumor or targeting or trafficking to virally infected cells, as in the case of HIV, is that you, um, you have to deal with potential toxicity of the cars themselves. You have to ensure that you can actually traffic those cars or those cells that are targeted against that um, target cell to the particular location in the body. And you also have to deal with a lot of immunosuppressive factors in the body. So you have things such as um, downregulation of the antigen of interest, which means that the car will not be appropriately directed to those cells. Um, you have other sorts of immunosuppressive secreted factors, such as reactive oxygen species. And then, of course, you have um, things that are going to be secreted from the target cells themselves. So ultimately, there's a lot of barriers that um, in a patient, in a human, um, becomes very problematic to overcome. So in order to appropriately direct research and development methods, um, we obviously have a lot of those challenges that we have to um, ad address. So of course, we have to be able to identify and characterize new targets for cell therapy. Um, and that includes high throughput phenotypic as well as functional assays. So we need to make sure that those cell therapy, those cell products are expressing the receptor of interest, they're targeting the appropriate antigen, um, that they're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing, so they're actually killing those cells. Um, and, if, and of course, when we're dealing with clinical product, we have to also make sure that those samples are healthy, they're viable, they're active. Um, you know, we have to make sure that we adjust dosage properly, so we have to be able to count them. Um, and then, of course, when we're doing preclinical and even clinical research, we have to make sure that those cell products um, are highly specific for the target of interest. So that means reducing off-target effects, making sure that we're not non-specifically killing other cells in the patient or killing other cells in the cell culture. And of course, um, when we're dealing in the context of tumor immunotherapy, um, for many solid tumors, we have to, of course, uh, model three-dimensional cell culture models to appropriately mirror the tumor microenvironment. And that includes, um, you know, prolonging the health and the persistence of these immune cells so we don't see um, exhaustion and ultimately loss of efficacy. So traditional cell-based assay technologies utilize things like flow cytometry, where you have a sample that you've harvested, you run through a flow cytometer, um, meaning a fluidic sheath with a laser detection platform, and you calculate your data as a function of scatter plots, um, where each dot represents a, an object of interest or an event. Um, of course, limitations to that become, um, you know, it doesn't work that well with adherent cells. It can be very time consuming to process samples. If you're dealing with 3D architecture, of course, you lose that spatial integrity. Um, so that's where something like a microscope would come in, which can maintain that three dimensional architecture. But of course, that can be very time intensive. Um, 
another alternative would be something like a plate reader, a fluorescent or a luminescent ba based plate reader, which are going to capture data very quickly. But again, it's only reporting well level data. So you can't normalize to well to well variations within a cohort of samples. So Nexalom enables you to uh, overcome some of those uh, roadblocks by being able to do cell level and cell based analyses. Um, so we're a global company. We have a variety of families of instruments that are really all designed for image based cell analysis. Um, they all have distinct roles within the lab. Um, and of course, all of our team of scientists across the, the world can really address and answer those questions for you. Um, the first roadblock is really dealing with a lot of these primary samples. And so this is where the Celica MX would come into play. So when you're dealing with preclinical um, animal or human research or even clinical research, often you have cell counting bottlenecks. As Jim mentioned, you're dealing with a lot of these different constructs um, where you have different co-stimulatory cars that you're testing for efficacy and potency and production of inflammatory cytokines. So you're often dealing with large amounts of samples. So the Celica enables you to count and high throughput up to 24 samples in two and a half minutes or less to export things like viability, cell concentration, um, and things like GFP expression. This enables you to address those cell challenges in those complex preclinical and clinical research models. So in the context of CAR um, isolation, primary sample isolation, CAR um, programming and, and T cell expansion, you can utilize this through every step, um, including assessing the count and viability of whole blood samples. Um, and that's going to be true for mouse preclinical samples, uh, patient biopsies, whether they're liquid or solid tumors, patient derived organoids, as well as when you're handling large numbers of samples. Um, such as when you're processing cell therapy products or dealing with even mouse preclinical samples. From there, you can really step into the realm of image cytometry, which enables you to quantify images to produce cell level data in a kinetic as well as endpoint basis. Um, by being able to image whole well format in a variety of in vitro cell culture models, you can quantify cell level data without having to harvest or trypsinize or even trypsinize adherent samples. So utilizing this approach, um, we use the Celigo, which has a five imaging platform, five channels, um, bright field and four fluorescent colors. And it enables you to image and quantify whole well format from any plate format from a six well plate all the way up to a 1536 well plate. And that includes in all five imaging channels. Um, representative time to scan is shown in that um, box in the bottom right there, but it's going to be on the scale of minutes. And that includes for any plate format. Um, and we also have adapters for some flasks and other vessels. What this enables you to do is get very flat illumination all the way to the well edge, which is going to be very distinct from that of a conventional microscope, um, to enable whole, whole well and high throughput imaging, um, even when you're assessing rare events. So when we're talking about these functional applications, the first thing is looking at these cell therapy products. So we want to make sure that these immune cells are functional, that they're viable, that they're activated, that they're proliferating appropriately. So by utilizing the Celigo, you're actually able to quantify and assess T cell proliferation in a label-free format. So this is an image of a 96 well. Um, you can see that red square is indicating a zoomed in region and the blue segmentation is denoting the software identifying the T cells that are quantified by the, the imager. Um, it takes about six minutes to perform imaging and analysis in a label free format using Brightfield for a 96 well plate and that's whole well imaging. Utilizing this approach, we have a very broad dynamic range for T-cell counting. So these are 120,000 cells per well, all the way down to 8,000 cells per well. You can see the cells in Brightfield there and the representative segmentation. Um, and taking this approach, we actually assess some of those CAR constructs um, that Jim had mentioned with these different co-stimulatory molecules. So we utilize the Celigo to assess um, kinetic proliferation represented here as population doublings for these different um, car constructs that we were assessing. And as you can see here, um, we were able to quantify seven different constructs over the course of a 10 day growth curve um, and quantify that in a very rapid and high throughput fashion.
Now, of course, we do see some differential proliferation rates, which Jim actually uh, mentioned during his talk, um, based on the, the presence of, of a given co-stimulatory domain there. We also wanted to um, quantify whether or not the Saligo could assess activation of the T cells as a function of area of the T cells. So as T cells are uh, naive or dormant, essentially, they're going to be very small and rested. But as they're activated, they're preparing for division. They're producing all sorts of um, you know, cytokines and other sorts of molecules. And so their area of the cells themselves or the volume of those cells will swell. Um, and that tends to peak around six or seven days after activation, to which point they then start to rest in a somewhat smaller state. Um, so we utilize the Saligo here. You can see these images. These are the same scale um, at day zero, day six, and day 10 of this T cell activation um, screen. And you can see even just by eye that the T cells are visibly larger at day six compared to day zero and then somewhat smaller by day 10. We actually then plotted that as a function of the, the um, surface area of the T cells or the, uh, sorry, the cross-sectional area of the T cells here. And you can see that even amongst the different um, constructs that were tested, you see that very similar trend that they started a very small resting size, they increased in size to peak around day six, and then they actually reduced in size as they returned to a somewhat rested stage. So this is a nice indication of monitoring activation of these T cells in question. In addition to looking for things like proliferation as a function of number of cells over time and activation as a function of size, you can also utilize the fluorescence capabilities to assess things like viability or apoptosis of these cell therapy or patient products. So here we've got um, three images depicting AOPI-based fluorescence viability. So your green cells are viable cells, your red cells are dead cells, and then non-fluorescent objects are anucleated debris. So those could be things like residual red blood cells cells or platelets in your PBMCs, um, and then in your T-cell expansion image there, um, you can have some tissue debris, especially in the later stage of expansion. You can couple viability with something like apoptosis markers, as you see in the right-hand panel of four images, where we look at things like caspase 3-7 activation, which will fluoresce in green in cells that have initiated the caspase cascade, and then, of course, propidium iodide-positive cells, where now they have a compromised membrane or are closer to true um, cell death. Finally, you can also couple that with true markers of activation. So here we did immunofluorescence-based staining for CD69 for activation in CD4 and CD8 T cells. So we have CD4, Lexfluor 488, CD8 PE, and then CD69, 647. We use hooks as a counter stain there and then quantified the proportion of activated T cells as a function of um, different stimulation of these populations. So once you've been able to characterize your T-cell products or your cell therapy products, you know that you're, they're activated, they're proliferating, they're viable, then of course we need to assess potency of them. So there's a variety of different direct cell killing methods to assess potency or in vitro efficacy of these cell therapy products. Ultimately, many of these have limitations. Um, a lot of them are indirect measurements of cell death. You have to have a lot of internal normalization controls. Or if you're using flow cytometry, of course, we have to harvest those cells. So we're limited as to being able to do kinetic assays. So using the Saligo, you can actually quantify cell-mediated lysis in a high-throughput and direct cell quantification method. So by having a fluorescently labeled target cell population, you can quantify kinetically or endpoint um, in cell-level data how many target cells are killed over time or under differential experimental conditions. So here we're just showing we use calcine AM to label our, our, target, our target cells here. These are K562s. This is an example of a, a bulk PBMC killing assay. So the PBMCs are unlabeled in bright fields. And then the segmentation is denoting the identified target cells that are viable. So as those targets are killed by the PBMCs, they will lose that green fluorescence. So we're able to actually quantify this over time. So we used, again, calcine AM labeled K562s as a target cell here. These images are captured at four hours after adding effectors. Um, and then, of course, we actually added IL-2 to prime those PBMCs. So you can see that we have, obviously, a dose-dependent effect based on E to T ratio, but also an effect based on the presence or absence of IL-2.
You can take this approach and expand this to test different car constructs. So here we use CHO cells that were expressing the antigen of interest. So these were engineered to express a given antigen. And we assess 11 different car constructs um, to assess viability or killing of those CHO cells over an eight hour time course. And of course, you can see that there is an E to, e to T dependent effect, so higher E to T ratio, you have more killing over time, but you also have some differential effects based on the car construct here. Um, and this enables you to screen really rapidly up to say 150 different test conditions in 20 minutes or less. So taking that approach, we actually wanted to assess these HIV cars um, of interest. So here we have um, those, those cars that Jim had previously discussed. Um, we have the on-target um, K562s that are expressing the HIV envelope protein. And then we have the off-target K562. So those are the K wild types. We have the, the cars themselves. So they're transduced to express the car of interest. And then of course we have untransduced T cells. So you can see here that at, at, an, at higher E to T dependent ratios, you see increased killing of these um, target K562s expressing the HIV envelope protein. You can see a loss of those GFP expressing K562 cells uh, as a function of E to T ratio. Um, of course, we see little to no effect with the untransduced conditions. You do see a little bit at the higher E to T ratio with some off target killing. Um, but again, that, that's not unexpected. The additional advantage is that it enables you to do this kinetically. So we monitored these different um, car constructs over time, over a 72 hour killing curve. And on the very top panel, you have just the, the on-target GFP k 562 So the k 562 is expressing the HIV envelope protein. You have the second row is your on-target K562s with the untransduced T cells. And the bottom is with the actual cars of interest. And so as you can see very clearly by eye, over time, you see a very pronounced loss of those viable K562s only in the case of the co-culture with the cars themselves. And in, in the other conditions, you see obviously a proliferation of those cells over the 72 hour time course. The data again is plotted there. You can also use this to monitor combinatorial approaches. So here we're looking at um, uh, checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So this is a different type of immunotherapy to assess the ability of this checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Um, here it's a tezolizumab, which is a PDL1 inhibitor. And then we used um, um, chloroquine and MG132 as uh, monitoring the ability to augment T cell based cytotoxicity. Um, and so here you can monitor the um, significant reduction in the number of viable target cells in uh, breast cancer cells here. So this is a cancer cell immunotherapy, um, both at 24 hours and at six hours um, with and without the uh, augmenting therapies here. So again, these are all done in 2D culture, but another, um, another interesting facet that you might be able to uh, interrogate is doing a cold culture to assess the specificity of an immunotherapy. So another question is we want to ensure that these cell therapy products are not eliciting off-target killing. So here you can actually do a co-culture with two different fluorescent reporter cell lines to monitor the specificity of your cell therapy products. So here we have GFP expressing HEC293s that are expressing the antigen of interest, and the other ones are M-Cherry expressing HEC293s that are not expressing the antigen of interest. These are co-cultured at a ratio of one-to-one, -one, so 50-50 in each well. And then we added six different CAR-T constructs at different E to T ratios. And we wanted to monitor specific T cell killing in a time-dependent manner. Um, and this actually also happened to be a cell therapy for HIV. So it's a uh, MBL, uh, mannose binding lectin. And so here you can see your off-target cars, uh, your off-target cells, your m chair expressing cells. Over time, you see no pronounced change in the number of cells with target alone versus with your cars of interest. Um, again, these m chairs are not expressing the antigen. Whereas with the GFP target cells, you see a very obvious dose-dependent effect with increasing proportions of CAR to target cells. Um, and obviously you have the most pronounced reduction with your one-to-one -one ratio. Target alone looks very similar to, um, you know, what you would expect, uh, no, no off-target killing here. So by utilizing this image-based method, you can actually assess two independent differential populations using the same test conditions without having to have different, um, different wells there. 
And then the last thing I really want to dive into is just scaling this up to look for 3D cell culture models. So taking those approaches we utilize in 2D and um, assessing 3D culture models in the context of solid tumor therapies. So here's looking at an ADCC based cell, cell cytotoxicity assay in a 3D spheroid model. So that schematic is just defining how we form these spheroids in a U bottom plate. So these are K562 cells that we've um, generated spheroids with. We've labeled with calcine A as a marker for viability. And then we looked at E to T dependent ratio for NK cell mediated killing. And after four hours, you can see very obviously a loss of viability, particularly at the exterior of the spheroid, particularly with your higher E to T dependent ratios. And that's in contrast to your negative control wells there. You can also assess things like T-cell-based killing. This is a, a bispecific-based immunotherapy. So MTAC is a bridge between CD3 on a T-cell and then HLA peptide on a cancer cell of interest. Um, so adding MTAC should, in theory, prime those T-cells to elicit cell killing of the target cells. So these are GFP-expressing spheroids. You see um, almost no loss of viability with obviously target only, so just the spheroid, but with just T cells and targets, um, you don't see a pronounced effect. As you start to add MTAC with the effectors and the targets, you start to see not only a loss of the GFP expression as those target cells are killed, but also a dissolution of the size and integrity of the spheroid. And finally, you can scale that up to patient-derived organoids, where you can actually assess these in a more physiologically relevant solid tumor model. So these are colorectal cancer organoids. We're looking at a, a bispecific antibody therapy called cibisatamab, which is targeting CEA antigen on colorectal cancer. Um, so these uh, PDOs were scored based on the expression, baseline expression of the antigen of interest of CEA. And then we assess the efficacy of the T cells to kill those those organoids uh, with the cibisabimab treatment. So colorectal co cancer organoids that had high levels of CEA expression, so a very, very pronounced, um, whoops, very pronounced um, E to T dependent um, killing of the organoid tissue particularly when compared to your untargeted control antibody. Um, we did not see that effect with just the T cells themselves. It was only upon addition of the cibisatamab to act, act as a bridge there. Um, we did not see that effect when we looked at organoids with low expression of CEA or in organoid culture that had mixed or intermediate levels of CEA expression. So again, this enables us to utilize this as a screening tool for more personalized medicine therapeutic modalities. We do have a broad variety of publications that use Saligo for these immunotherapy type assays, including um, one for HIV that, that um, I presented some data on just now. Um, of course, a broad variety for other sorts of immunotherapies. Um, we're happy to send those publications along to anybody. Um, and I think now is a great time to take any questions anybody has. Thanks, Andrea, and thanks, Dr. Riley. Uh, now it's time for you to enter questions into the chat box, and we'll just give it a second here. Uh, Andrea, you had mentioned at the end of Dr. Riley's talk that you possibly had some questions for him. Um, while we wait for people to ask questions, is there something you'd like to mention with, to him? Sure, Jim. I was wondering, um, you know, I know that you've you've mentioned and we've observed that we do have differential proliferation of those cars with the different co-stimulatory molecules. Do you have a mechanism at, as to what might account for that differential proliferation? Is it simply just some of the intracellular signaling that you would expect? Uh, we don't have a complete answer, but certainly the 401B signal uh, uh, definitely gives a survival advantage. So again, cell growth is a combination of cell division, you know, versus cell death. And so, if the cells aren't dying as rapidly, it looks like they're growing faster. Um, so that's certainly the case there. And then uh, for the CD28, we think that signal terminally differentiates the cell so that they, um, you know, sort of lose their peripheral capability. Um, in a short, like weak assay, you don't see it that pronounced, but in the vivo study, that's where you really see um, the, the effect of CD28. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and and when you're looking at some of these, because because I know you had mentioned that what was somewhat counterintuitive was that the ones that seem to elicit lower cytokine profiles, and correct me if I, I um, interpreted that wrong, but lower inflammatory cytokine profiles actually seem to fare better in the in vivo model. Is that what you guys had observed? Right, right. Just because those cells proliferated to a much you know, higher level. So, you know, they became, you know, 10 to 100 to 1 versus CD28. So it ended up being cells with less um, capability actually controlled the replication better because there was just a lot more of them. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So I have a question. Uh, can you measure T cell proliferation while doing the 3D based ADCC? Oh, that's a great question. So it would depend a little bit on how you're setting up your assay. So in a U-bottom plate, if you have, if you're generating a single spheroid in a U-bottom plate, um, it's going to be very challenging to see kind of the individual T cells um, because, of course, you have a rounded bottom. However, if you're interested more in something like T cell proliferation and expansion um, in the context of a culture model like that, then you could transfer those spheroids to something like a flat bottom plate and you would have a, a greater likelihood of being able to assess t-cell proliferation for something like that um, i may recommend using a, a fluorescent reporter like a cfse or something like that to label the t-cells because then what you can actually do is you can um, gate out any debris from the spheroid that might be um, you know perturbing your ability to image and quantify the t-cells themselves okay Great. The next question I have is, how do you best measure T cell proliferation and activation? Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, I think that's going to be somewhat dependent on what your assay is dictating. Um, again, you know, as we've worked with with Jim's group and with a few others, we do that in a label free format. We're looking at both just number of number of cells over time. Um, as well as the size, the change in size over time as they become activated. Um, however, if you're doing that in a co-culture system or if you're looking to assess a really definitive indicator of activation, then of course you have a variety of different markers that you can do immunofluorescence-based staining to assess them. Okay, I have a question for Dr. Riley. If there is a constant pressure on HIV to mutate, as you showed in the first set of clinical data, do you see most therapies continue to chase the next mutation? If CD8 receptor on CD4 showed similar killing, why use CD4 on a CD4 T cell? You had me to the last one there, but yeah, I mean, so the, the, the reason we use CD4, you know, it, most car constructs use a single chain antibody to retarget the T cells. Um, and you certainly can do that for HIV. The, the problem there is that HIV's envelope is highly mutatable. So you would have to then use a you know, pretty large cocktail of car T cells to sort of get the same effect. Um, by using CD4 itself, um, we hypothesize that if HIV was to escape from binding to CD4, then it just would, it would lose a lot of its potency. It wouldn't be infectious. And so uh, that was, you know, for a firstly human trial, it was better to have one product, and that's why we chose to use CD4. But I didn't quite get the last part of the question, so maybe rephrase that or. The first question? The second part. Of the the second part. If CD8 receptor on CD4 showed similar killing, why use CD4 on a CD4 T cell? Uh, Right, because uh, killing is not everything that you need. Um, you know, CD4 cells play a huge role in terms of, um, you know, providing cytokine signals to the CD8 cells to uh, IL-2, IL-21. The, the CD4 cells can also then help with your B cell response and help regenerate and maybe help you develop neutralizing antibodies more. So. Um, yeah, ideally you would want to put both cell types in, but I think if I only had, you know, if someone said you could only put one in, I'd rather just put a CD4 cell in because I think it's going to do more for your immune system than the CD8s would. Okay, and the first part of that question was, um, is there a constant pressure on HIV to mutate, as you showed in the first set of clinical data, 
do you see most therapies continue to chase the next mutation? Right. I mean, at, at some point, I mean, certainly what the, the, the drug therapies tell us is that if you have three separate pressures on HIV, that it can't usually escape all three at the same time. And I, I think for cure studies, that's probably where we're going to end up. I think we'll need some combination of T cells, you know, broadly neutralizing antibodies, NK cells perhaps. But, you know, Giving one one therapy at a time, generally HIV can get around that, and so I think that's why a combination of therapy is going to be required to you know enable a cure strategy. Okay, uh, was there differences in subtype of T cells, like in naive T cells versus effector T cells, regarding proliferation and activation in HIV patients? Um. So, so in the studies we did, we just used total bulk cells. So, you know, so they're a mixture of uh, you know central memory, naive cells, uh, and so within those populations, there are huge differences in terms of their ability to expand, make cytokines, and kill. Um, in, in that particular study, we didn't really tease that apart. Uh, sort of under the you know, the idea is that we really want to put all these types of T cells back into somebody because. Um, they each have their own little niche in the immune system, and so the more we reconstitute that, the better. Um, and uh, another question, have either of you run into issues regarding preserving these cells for the live cell assays? Um, I mean, for some of the assays you could do, um, I mean, you can use cytoplasmic preserve. I mean, maybe this Andrea, but for for us, we 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 find that we can use cytoplasmic preserve uh, uh, cells for many of these assays. Yeah, and and you know, I think I think that question really depends again on the cell culture model. You know, certain primary cells are going to be a little more fragile, and you're going to have to handle them, you know, more carefully. Whereas if you're dealing with a stable cell line, that's of course going to be more robust and you know be able to be perturbed more. Um, you know, for some of these killing assays that I was showing data from, um, you know, we're working with an engineered K562 cell line that's you know stably expressing GFP and the HIV envelope protein, um, and and grant. Granted, while those are, you know, primary expanded T cells, they are healthily maintained in culture until we added them to the cold culture. Um, so I think keeping in mind what your cell culture in vitro assay is and what your model is can really dictate or direct how you have to handle them. Okay, and I have uh, what looks like one last question. What if my target cells don't have fluorescent protein expression? How do I measure cytotoxicity? That's a great question. And I think something that comes up pretty, pretty frequently. So, um, you know, obviously a, a fluorescent protein expressing cell, target cell is, is the easiest to work with in the context of quantifying um, killing over time. But there are a few other methods that you can employ. Um, some of that's going to depend on the time course for your killing. So for T-cell killing assays, we were, as you probably noticed, we're conducting those over the course of several days. Um, so if you didn't have a fluorescent protein expressing cell line, then you can use cell tracker dyes like a cell trace violet or a CMFDA um, in combination with a viability stain. We often use PI or um, Nexalon actually have a, a whole um, array of viability stains that are compatible with Saligo that we created protocols for. Um, if it's a shorter term killing assay, like an NK based killing assay, which often um, are completed within four hours or so, you know, certainly less than 24 hours, then you could use other things like a calcine AM, which is a similar viability or vitality reagent, or a calcine AM violet as well. So there are a few different options out there um, that you can utilize. Um, we even do have some people that are doing um, surface marker staining in live cell culture so they can really differentiate different cell populations uh, in that mixed culture. Okay, we've had some great questions. I'd like to thank Dr. Riley and Dr. Love for their presentations today. And I'd like to thank all of our attendees for taking time to attend today's presentation. If you have any additional questions, you can submit them uh, through the Ask a Specialist uh, booth at the event. 
Uh, we do ask that you complete a short survey at the close of this webinar. Your thoughts and comments would be greatly appreciated. Make sure you visit the poster hall and exhibit booths where you can learn more about a variety of exciting technologies, including some of the ones shared during today's presentation. This presentation was recorded and will be available to view on demand. Until next time, have a great day.